When do small decisions make big differences? Is there anything new in the world today? Or has it all happened before? What can we learn from Julius Caesar's fateful decision to cross the Rubicon, to take that one small step that changed everything? All this and more on today's Ra The Rabbit Hole, a Liberty Nation production. I'm your host, Mark Angelides. There comes a time when a final, irrevocable decision must be made. A time when all good men and women must make a choice to either fully commit or to withdraw and deal with fate on terms that they themselves have not created. Global politics is at such a crux right now. Since 2016, with the election of Donald Trump and the historic Brexit vote, a series of options has been placed before us. Now, depending on your political perch, the goddesses of fate have laid certain paths before you, and you can either jump on the bandwagon of the approaching upheaval that seems destined to come, or you can oppose it and fight what's going to happen. Whether you pick a side or try to sit out this global political warfare, there are certain ideological stakes, and you can either be a soldier or a casualty. But you and I are mere mortals. We have little to no influence on the world stage, nor leading roles in the global theatre. What can we as individuals do to make a significant difference? I want to tell you about a simple action taken in 49 BC by Julius Caesar. Now, it's a familiar tale, but it's one that shows the impact that just one small step can make. Crossing the Rubicon. To cross the Rubicon, it's a phrase we're all familiar with, and we all know what happened because of Caesar's decision. But what of the events that led to that cold January morning when Caesar cried out to his loyal men, quote, Take we the course which the signs of the gods and the false dealings of our foes point out. The die is cast. End quote. As our previous episodes of The Rabbit Hole have shown, there is nothing new under the sun. All this has happened before, and will doubtless happen again. The actors change, the stages move, but the script and the machinations remain the same. I'm going to tell you of the events that led directly to Caesar standing on the bank of a small river on the border of Italy and Gaul over 2,000 years ago, with Rome ahead of him and the weight of a new world on his shoulders. He took that irrevocable step and created our present. I wonder how much of this you'll recognise as the follies and games that we see around us today. You see, this tale really began 30 years earlier, in around 81 BC when Julius Caesar was just Gaius, and Sulla had been granted the powers of a dictator due to political and social unrest, that to be quite honest, he was largely responsible for himself. Now, upon coming to full power, Sulla began his prescriptions. This was essentially a naughty list of people who were not his supporters. Taxes were levied, property seized, people were even killed. He ignored the structures of power that had served Rome so well since becoming a republic, and he tore through the constitution. Instead of following the usual procedures, he would exercise his authority in much the same way as a president, who relies not upon Congress to get laws passed, but executive orders, and those who opposed him were crushed. Gaius Julius Caesar was a young man, and he had the misfortune to be on Sulla's list. Sulla demanded that he divorce his new wife, who was the daughter of Sulla's enemy, Cinna. Now Caesar, showing the uh, audacity and the stubborn streak that would later bring him to that small river between Gaul and Italy so many years later, he refused. And with that decision, he had to flee Rome. Why Sulla didn't just execute him, we don't really know. What we do know is that Sulla said of the young Caesar, I see many Mariuses in him. Marius being Caesar's uncle, who was a real force to be reckoned with. Despite Sulla's harshness, his exercise of ultimate power did little or nothing to correct the vein of corruption that ran through Roman political life. He reformed the court system, but packed them with sympathisers to his cause. He increased the number of senators to 600, again filling those seats with members of the equestrian classes, who were mostly Sulla loyalists. 
in around 78 BC, Sulla decided to retire. And what he left behind was a political system ripe for power grabs, corruption, and social malfeasance on an unprecedented scale. And this was the acorn that would eventually become the great oak that Caesar would later try to fell. In 60 BC, in the midst of what can only be described as Machiavellian machinations in Rome, Caesar joined forces to create the infamous Triumvirate with Pompey and Crassus. Pompey for his powerful friends, Crassus for his endless wealth. Julius Caesar played the game well and accrued a lot of popular support, not just among the nobles of Rome, but among the people. He was the world's first populist. Naturally, his partners and the great and good of Rome couldn't stand to have someone so popular as a threat to their particular swamp, so they sought to cut his power from under him. The Optimates, who were basically aristocrats in the Senate, were waiting for his consulship to end, so he wouldn't have the immunity that it granted. But Caesar, he was a smart guy, and he knew that his enemies were gunning for him, and he knew pretty much what they had planned for him. So using the last of his dwindling favours, he cut a deal and fled to Gaul, where, as we know, he ran a successful campaign against the Gaulish warriors that lasted eight long years. We, we now call these the Gallic Wars, and they're an incredible set of stories about which we'll do at least one episode of The Rabbit Hole. The battles that took place put anything Hollywood could come up with to shame. So despite having to flee for a second time in his life, Caesar had once again risen to the top. He was hugely popular among the people of Rome, who loved to hear his in-depth reports and stories about fighting the Gauls. He had wealth in abundance from all the Gaulish gold. And once again, he was under threat by those who sought to keep their power base safe from interlopers. Caesar had a keen political instinct. Using the treasure he had gained in the Gaulish campaign, he began gaining supporters through Rome and her territories, much to the chagrin of those optimates who had a stranglehold on decision-making and appointments. So they sought to cut him off from power entirely. They accused him of corruption and abuses of power, pretty much the exact same crimes that they themselves were involved in, and ordered him to stand down, renounce his governorship, uh, thereby removing his executive privilege and return to Rome to face the equivalent of a judicial oversight committee. But Caesar, again, refused to be cut out of the action by lesser men, and said that he would stay on until 49 BC, at which point he would return to Rome and stand for election as consul. Naturally, his enemies couldn't abide this. They knew that he would win the election, and with it, their power base would be dismantled, their swamp drained. So they set about trying to undermine him with rumours, lies, and attempts at prosecution. So little appears to have changed in 2,000 years. There was no way that Caesar was going to disband his army as ordered by the Senate, and in 50 BC, something happened that should have given the corrupt holders of power pause for thought. The Parthians, a powerful Iranian empire, began threatening Rome's borders. To fend them off, Caesar agreed to meet his legion with Pompey's and defend the territory but when he handed over control of his 15th legion, the threat from the Parthians, it mysteriously disappeared and Pompey ended up with control of the majority of Caesar's forces. Surely this must break him, the wise senators of Rome thought. A man without a command, without a major army, must surely now finally come to heel. But strangely, Caesar grew bolder in defeat. We've talked about this uh, almost unnatural confidence he had in, in an earlier episode of The Rabbit Hole. It's really something difficult to believe. But his whole career, his whole life was dominated by this boldness and audacity. This refusal to let other men make his fate for him. The whole system began mobilising against Caesar. And they did this out of fear. Pompey, a, a great general by anyone's standards, felt sure that if push came to shove, he could beat Caesar in numbers. He was sure that wherever he went, he could raise armies and defeat the upstart. He said, quote, Legions will spring up anywhere I stamp on the ground in Italy. End quote. The situation was surmised rather wisely by a man called Marcus Rufus, who wrote a letter to Cicero saying, quote, The closer we come to this inevitable clash, the more apparent the danger. At the heart of the issue is this. Pompey declares he won't allow Caesar to be elected consul, unless Caesar relinquishes control over his army and provinces. Caesar, on the other hand, 
is convinced his status is threatened if he gives up his troops. So now, their scandalous liaison isn't stepping behind the scenes, but exploding into full-scale war. End quote. What Rufus said about behind the scenes. This is important. What I think he was getting at was that there was an undercurrent in Roman society. The populist versus the aristocrats. Uh, the people versus the powers. And, and the powerful figures, in fear, granted Pompey all the powers available to defend them against this growing threat. By now, some major horse trading was taking place. Caesar actually offered to stand down on the condition that Pompey do exactly the same. And by now, the Senate was terrified. They declared Caesar a public enemy, or as they called it, hostis publicus, meaning an enemy to the people. Now, Mark Antony, in his new role of tribune, had the power to veto this decision, and he did. But the Senate overturned this veto. They ignored it. The two tribunes, Mark Antony and Quintus Cassius, their positions usurped by Roman swamp dwellers, and their powers, their legal powers, ignored in favour of crushing this populist uprising. They had no choice but to flee. They dressed as slaves, escaped the city, and joined up with Caesar to be part of his army. In early January, Caesar, upon hearing what the Senate had planned for him, began his own preparations. He ordered his 13th legion to set up camp on the northern bank of the Rubicon. Now, these were soldiers who had been with Caesar for, for around nine years. They trusted him, they admired him. And although they could guess exactly what he had in mind, they followed his orders, knowing full well that they would be considered by the Senate as traitors and enemies to Rome. The famous poet Lucan said that when Caesar had decided his course of action, he said, quote, Here I abandon peace and desecrated law. Fortune, it is you I follow. Farewell to treaties. From now on, war is our judge. End quote. One day before meeting up with his army at the Rubicon, Caesar was still playing the game of feints and misdirections. To allay suspicion, he attended a, a big public event in Ravenna, and while there he attended a dinner, presumably with himself as the guest of honour. Now, while dining, he excused himself, telling the other guests they'd only be away a moment and, and would be back shortly. But outside, there was a chariot attached to mules waiting for him. He began the journey. Now comes the moment that has shaped every other from then on. Caesar, on the banks of the Rubicon, his army, ready to follow and die if so ordered. He knew that this was the final step. There would be no turning back. His course would be set, and win or lose, there would be no more hands to play. The die is cast. What follows is our history, the history of Western civilization. If Caesar had delayed, Pompey would likely have crushed him. If Caesar had hesitated in making this final, irrevocable decision, all would have been lost. And this is where we find ourselves today. We have the corruption of the political swamp, willing to overturn the laws and institutions of their nations in order to keep the power for themselves. We have powerful forces working against populist uprisings in order to maintain the status quo that has served them so well. And we each need to make a choice. We can choose which side we support. Will we go quietly along with a system that is in place, or will we back the outsider? Will we accept that our laws and constitution can be bypassed for the sake of vampires who thrive on power over other men? Or will we seize opportunity, and like Caesar, discard the false dealings of our foes, and say to one and all that the die is cast? Thank you for listening to The Rabbit Hole, Politics and Prose, a LibertyNation.com production. Join us next episode, where we'll be talking more history, politics, legends and stories. Until next time, thanks for listening.